Welcome to World Builds With Us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Daniel Quinn and Christopher Prunty. Gentlemen, very excited to have you on today because in today's episode, we are interviewing Professor Hugh O'Connell, and we're going to cut to that interview now. And welcome. Today, we are honored to be joined by Professor Hugh O'Connell. Uh, Hugh, for those of us who might not know very much about you, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, uh, thank you first for having me here. Uh, I guess the easiest way to <laughs> explain why I'm here is I'm a professor of English at University of Massachusetts, Boston, uh, but I primarily specialize in courses on science fiction and like related issues of like utopian and dystopian studies um, and things like that. So I'm, I'm one of those few, few academics who is one interested in science fiction, but also like primarily teaches um, in science fiction. Uh, most academics who are interested in science fiction have to like carve out little courses here and there. Like they have to like mostly teach other things. Um, and I'm one of those few that primarily gets to teach in science fiction and other related uh, issues. Yeah. And uh, I actually kind of wanted to start there because you didn't actually start out with science fiction necessarily, did you? No, uh, not at all. This is one of those things that um, occasionally creates some uh, friction uh, for me with uh, science fiction fans is that my background is not in fandom at all. Um, in fact, I, w I never would have even considered myself a fan of science fiction or even like a reader or anything like that um, until I was actually in grad school. Um, I grew up in like an artsy kind of punk kind of uh, community. Um, and so like everything there was like always like super literary, right? And, you know, science fiction was considered, you know, mere genre fiction, right? So we were like the punks who were like, you know, touring in vans and stealing copies of like Ulysses from the bookstore to read and stuff like that. Um, and then it wasn't until I was in grad school um, that I, I was really interested in Marxism and utopian theory. And I had this professor who was like, look, if this is what you're interested in, you got to stop reading all this boring bourgeois white middle class fiction and start looking into science fiction. This is like where the real work of like world building happens of like utopian studies. This is like where all the Marxists migrated it to. And so like in, in some ways, I think my transition into science fiction studies was nerdier, uh, quote unquote, I guess, <laughs> um, than like the average science fiction fan. Like I got into it through critical theory in grad school. Um, so it's like this kind of like <laughs> weird trajectory into science fiction. Um, I would say though, like on like looking backwards, I always like once I got into science fiction studies and utopian studies and started like doing it for real, I one did become a fan. Uh, but looking backwards, I had realized like how much of my life I had actually gravitated towards things like science fiction. As a kid, my favorite like video games were like Metroid, right? I was I I, I was born in '78, so my whole life is like post Star Wars. Some of my earliest memories are going to Star Wars films. I loved watching reruns of Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers on TV as a kid. You know, that, that's the kind of thing like when I skipped school or I pretended to be sick in grade school, right? I'd be watching like the reruns uh, of of shows like that. And so like I, I realized like looking back like how much my childhood and my like you know cultural outlook was shaped by science fiction even though I never would have considered myself like part of that uh, community growing up. So I have a, I have a question for you. That's probably the, one of the most controversial questions I can imagine being asked in science fiction, especially since you're like an academic who studies it. How would you describe to someone who's unfamiliar with the genre? What is science fiction? And as a extra question for that, um, how would you say utopian studies in science fiction is different um, or adds to science fiction as a genre? Uh, that's, it's a good question and frankly, a really difficult one for me. To <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but no, it's fair. I, I get this question a lot, right? Because, you, you know, I teach primarily courses in science fiction. There aren't that many science fiction fans at UMB. And so the majority of my students are not coming out of fandom either. And so like, that's like one of their questions often is like, well, what is science fiction? Like, like how do I read this thing? I, I, I've never done science fiction before. What am I doing in this classroom? Um, and so I just try to explain to the uh, students that like, 
for me, reading, I think a way, at least a way to translate it to students, and this is not my definition of science fiction, but a way to translate it to people um, who are coming from maybe a literary background or English majors, is I tell them it's kind of like reading like historical fiction. Right? When you read something like Shakespeare, from our point of view, you have to figure out how that world works. You have to figure out how the class systems work, the gender systems, because they don't like work like they do in you know, our zero world. And so for me, kind of reading science fiction is like, I explained to him, it's like learning to read the rules of a world. Um, and it's a way of trying to kind of think about like, as you're reading, like your world building as you're actually kind of reading. Um, and for me, that's one of the ways I begin to kind of think about science fiction is its emphasis is often on the stuff that falls into the background in what we might call realist kind of fiction, right? If one of the kind of and this is maybe hackneyed, but if one of the kind of differences between like realist fiction and, you know, science fiction is that like realism privileges this kind of rich interiority and psychology of its, uh, you know, usually boring bourgeois characters. Um, part of that is because we can take its world for granted. And so we can kind of mm -hmm. focus on the interiority of the, the characters and all that kind of psychology because we don't have to figure out how the world works as readers. Um, but in science fiction, we're, we're constantly being drawn attention to this notion that um, we have to kind of read the world. We have to read the rules. We have to read the kind of uh, infrastructure, all these other kind of things. And so as much as maybe an academic like Darko Suvin is maybe a, a bit maligned these days for some of his formalist definitions of science fiction, one of the things that he said about science fiction that I've always loved is he says it's a reflection of and on reality. So at one hand, it's like, it's, you know, reflecting on our reality. It has to extrapolate out from something here, but it's also a reflection on the very concept reality, that reality is mutable. It's changeable. It's not just given. Um, and that's the way I tend to approach maybe uh, science fiction with my students is to try to get them to think about maybe those kind of questions um, when they're reading it. I'm, am I answering your question, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, is, I, I, I think it's extremely difficult to answer that question. So I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> and so what was the second bit about utopian? Oh, yeah. So like you also obviously have a focus in utopian studies. And mm -hmm. for our listeners who don't know what that is or what it means, like what does it mean in the context of science fiction or like literature in general? I'm going to riff a little bit off uh, maybe Darko Suvin again, just because he was like so foundational for science fiction studies and like entry points in. Um, but one of the things like he, he described utopian literature, things like, like literally like Thomas More's Utopia or Plato's Republic um, as being the sociopolitical version of science fiction. Right. So instead of like maybe inventing time machines or, you know, whatever you have as being like this kind of technological focus, they were thinking about innovations in like governing structures and stuff like that. So we might think of it as like sociological science fiction or something like that, where it really turns its attention um, and it's kind of extrapolative and metaphoric and allegorical attentions uh, to the more, let's say, like the structures uh, of society. And so, like, I really do often think of utopian literature and, and science fiction as, as somewhat, um, you know, often kind of intertwined. Um, and we can also think about it just in a very banal sense. Um, you can take, uh, you know, science fiction and we can often categorize it as, you know, dystopian, utopian pictures of, you know, of futures or other possibilities. Um, and so in that sense, like, I don't think you can really divorce um, science fiction from a kind of sense of utopianism if utopianism uh, has this kind of desire for something other, something kind of better. Um, if older utopias, like Thomas More's uh, famous, you know, book that gave us the name Utopia, right, if they looked to, like, other places on the map, right? Uh, Thomas More's Utopia was an island, you know, mm -hmm. um, like that. We can no longer think that way. Uh, you know, we, we've so thoroughly mapped our world. There's no more, you know, so-called blank spots on the map. And so we often think of utopias as maybe Uchronias. Uh, that is, instead of uh, the no place, it's like the, it has to be displaced in time, right? Mm -hmm. And so that gives uh -huh. us a very kind of science fictional kind of aspect to thinking about utopia. Um, obviously, utopia can't be now. I mean, look at this fucking world that we live in. This is not <laughs> utopia, right? Our best kind of sense of thinking about it is it has to be a, a kind of alter time. Um, and so I think to bring it really back to science fiction, I, I think the place where we see this the most is somebody like Kim Stanley Robinson, mm -hmm. um, who is just, uh, you know, 
schooled both in the, I mean, literally schooled. He studied with Frederick Jameson. He has a PhD um, in literary studies. Uh, but, you know, he's like steeped in both that kind of utopian end and that science fiction end. And he sees the two as being necessarily, you know, married to one another. How do we get, you know, a better future? How do we get something out of the kind of doldrums and dregs that, of this shit that we live in now? Um, mm -hmm. But that tends to be how I begin to kind of think about these things. I, I'm normally maybe a pessimist in, you know, my everyday life. And so like, I, I think I focus on like utopian ends to kind of remind me that, you know, this could be better. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, and I think science fiction is the kind of key genre for reminding us of that, that nothing has to be this way. So many things could be different than they are. Cool. That is, that's actually very pertinent. We're, uh, for a little, you know, inside baseball here, we're actually <laughs> recording this on the day of the election. And when this comes out, we might, we don't know if the election will be, have, you know, resolved by then. And I've, I've been actually, I've been thinking a lot about science fiction in this kind of framework where, you know, it, as, as much of a pessimist and as a cynic as I am, there is this kind of hopefulness in the future, right? And I think that that's where a lot of the science fiction stuff kind of comes in or where it gives hope to perhaps a nihilist who might see that there is hope in a future we don't see yet. You know, like today, and, and, and this is going to go extremely dark, so I apologize right now, <laughs> but as someone who feels in a lot of ways that existence can be pain and to exist, in, to exist is to suffer, there is this, there is this bright hope that it doesn't always have to be that way, that there is always something better to strive for. And I think that that's why science fiction in particular is so excellent at that, because as much as we love the grim and gritty cyberpunk, and as much as we love like the kind of blood soaked, grim, dark future, there is all like science fiction at its base imagines worlds that are inherently better than the ones that we're living in. Right. Unless we're talking about post-apocalyptic stuff. But even then, th there's always a theme of hope. And that's the thing that I really want to punch home is that that's how important that genre is, you know, to a lot of nerds. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was uh, one of the courses I was teaching recently. It was, was this last semester. Right. It was this uh, course on dystopias and trying to think about um, like how can we use dystopias as like part of like a political imagination? Right. How can we think about, um, you know, a, a better world through kind of examining the worst of our world? Uh, and so even things like cyberpunk with its, you know, um, at this point, kind of hackneyed and cheesy, grim, dark <laughs> worlds. I mean, it's so easy to do like, you know, just a, a spoof on cyberpunk. Right. It's just kind of turned into these like little tropes of fashion. And, you know, it's always raining out and there's a fire in a corner and you're always only ever in a fucking alleyway or something like that. There's never anything else going on in these worlds. There's never like joy or sunshine or daytime <laughs> or flowers or something like that. Um, as, as cheesy as that is, I think it does kind of give us a reminder um, that these kind of dystopian even visions that we get from cyberpunk, the, these cheesy, grim, dark worlds, are also kind of utopian at heart, right? There, there mm. is this kind of sense that dystopia isn't, um, what would I say, maybe like yeah, dystopias aren't anti-utopias. They're like, you know, utopias turned inverted. Dour. Yeah. Mm. Right. And, well, they're almost like a warning in a lot of ways, right? Like it's because it's, it's never like, it's never like dystopias are, uh, they come from the void. They're always, there's always some kind of seed of social unrest or some kind of anxiety that, you know, that grows and becomes the dystopic future. Like cyberpunk in particular is, uh, what is that? I want to say post-capitalism, but that's not accurate. What What's the term I'm looking for? Well, I, I tend to think of it as like, it, if we're going to call it post-capitalist, I think like the, the, the reason of thinking about it as post-capitalist would almost be in a kind of uh, backward sense and as in we can no longer think of anything but capitalism, mm -hmm. right? We look at the grand age of capitalism is capitalism either fighting against feudalism or against socialism or against communism, right? We live in that kind of age that uh, Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism, right? Where all we can think is capitalism and we're so kind of inside that whale uh, that there, we don't even see a way out. And so we no longer even, th I think the way of thinking post-capitalism is like we no longer even think capitalism, right? It's just become like the, it's the air that we breathe or, you know, it's the, the, the water that the fish are in. So you can't even like think it anymore because it's so ubiquitous or so like 
obvious to people as just being there. Right. And there's that, there's that stage of pre-corporation where capitalism takes whatever potential uh, threat there is to it and then makes it a safe capitalist exercise in a way. Hmm. It, it reminds me of what you were talking about, an essay about how, um, I guess you called, it, I wish you discussed it as post, post-colonial utopianism in, is a sense that imagining utopia as something other than capitalism because it's so like all-encompassing is that along the same lines as what you meant? Um, that would be, for me, that's a lot of the work that I actually do. Um, mm-hmm. I, I work in a lot of post-colonial utopianism, a lot of African science fiction. Um, and so much of it for me is about the way that they are imagining worlds and world structures and world systems um, mm-hmm. that are in confrontation with the kind of imperial capitalism of, of the West um, and the way that they can kind of begin to kind of, it seems like a, and, and this is probably, I'm, 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 I'm putting myself into like a corner that I don't think I actually believe. I'm going to play with it anyway. Um, it seems to me like that there is something about the uh, science fiction and the utopian literature coming out of the post-colonial world um, that still views um, capitalism as a kind of structure, whereas like cyberpunk ignores capitalism, like it just takes it as a default, it just assumes it as part mm-hmm. of its kind of world. And there is something about these kind of about the kind of post-colonial science fiction, particularly that. I think foregrounds it. It reminds us that capitalism is a, is a structure. It is a system. It's it's not it's not it, it's not that kind of neoliberal taken for granted. It just is there. It's the best of all fucking possible worlds, um, mm-hmm. and everything else would be uh, awful. And I think there is a way that they kind of foreground uh, those kind of views. I mean, you see it in like solar punk as well, I guess, yeah. in the West, um, particularly. Um, so maybe I'm maybe I, I'm backing myself back out of that corner with only <laughs> um, non-Western uh, science fiction, but I do think there is something about the kind of post-colonial utopianism that does look from outside of those like cyberpunk, grim, dark realities that how and the kind of futures they take for granted. There's a way that these kind of post-colonial utopian views no longer take that for granted and actually kind of you know raise it to our level of thinking about which was an awful way of saying that. Sorry. Well, the, the way that I always like to see it is if you're, when you're approaching like the way that especially cyberpunk tends to approach capitalism is this idea of like, if you're in a video game and you have a skybox, right? Like that is an artificial background that you can see and you acknowledge that's the furthest that my character can go. But in reality, it's constructed by a game designer and there is so much beyond that invisible skybox that you can explore. It's just that, you know, within the confines of the current system, you can't actually escape or explore around it. Which is why I love science fiction, right? Is that it, it at its, for me, at its best, what it does is reveal exactly that, right? It's, uh, this is like the cheesy Matrix moment, but where you see the coding behind reality. Um, I was demonstrably trying to avoid that, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's such an easy go-to reference. Um, a better reference is I, I was just teaching, and it's one of my favorite books. And it's, it's the, the whole reason I was teaching is just because I wanted to read it again, if I'm entirely honest, uh, which is China <laughs> Mieville's The City and the City. And oh, the yes, book, absolutely. Yeah, that book is just all about those kind of background logics, those background ideologies, and it raises that to like, a, like the level of a character, and it brings its world building right to the kind of forefront um, and that, I guess that's what I was trying to think about earlier when I said like Darko Suvin's kind of idea of science fiction is that reflection on and of reality, that our realities are kind of constructed and they have these ideologies and these systems and these limit thoughts behind them. And trying to expose that limit thought um, is, is one of the reasons I actually like cyberpunk. Like it, you can look at the way that cyberpunk reveals this exactly what you're calling that, that kind of box, that kind of invisible limit. Um, and even in the kind of negative sense, it brings that limit like to our forefront of like, we really need to fucking think past this thing, <laughs> um, <laughs> even to that kind of dystopian uh, end, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris, you had a question? Uh, yeah. It, it, oddly enough, you brought up China Mayville, and I was kind of, my question was how the new weird is becoming its own kind of uh, genre and everything. Uh, are there any other genres that seem to be spawning out of utopian kind of stuff that could be seen as a separate genre? Kind of like you mentioned solar punk and everything, but 
uh, other emergent ones such as that? Um, I'm trying to like think off the top of my head. This is like always one of the most nerve wracking things um, for an academic is like we're used to researching everything, writing everything, revising it. Um, thinking off the top of my head sometimes is not exactly my strong suit, I hate to say. Um, but I think I, one end of that is absolutely the new weird, uh, which is uh, I, I, I got into science fiction right around the time that like the new weird was bursting out, that there was all this kind of activity and post-colonial science fiction where it seemed like this, the rules of science fiction were breaking down where these kind of like sort of facile kind of arguments about you know science fiction versus fantasy versus horror versus all these other kind of things and, and the way that science fiction always tried to like elevate itself by not being fantasy by not being horror it played that same kind of literary game that uh literary fiction you know you, you would castigate genre fiction with um, and so for me, I think really uh, less than a particular like singular genre, um, although solar punk and hope punk have, have, have been like kind of thrown around recently or the new weird. I think just the kind of explosion uh, that's going on that science fiction is just being kind of torn apart from its white patriarchal capitalist uh, ends. And we're seeing just so much more work uh, by people of color, by women, by the trans community, by LGBTQ, right? And I think it's the way that science fiction is being torn apart and put back together. Um, and it's losing its kind of genre specificity. It's losing its kind of um, hard and tight borders. And it's being... Um, you know, it's science fiction is turning intersectional on the genre level as well as on the kind of cultural and political level. And for me, that's where I see the kind of real utopian work of science fiction these days. You know, rabid puppies and sad puppies be damned, you know, uh, fuck them, <laughs> castigate that stuff to history. And, uh, you know, let's kind of uh, see what we can kind of do with this fiction and bend it and twist it and break it and form it into new things. And that for me, I think, is where the kind of utopian end of uh, science fiction is the fact that we're ignoring those old white men rules the fact that we're kind of bending it towards what it's not supposed to be or that it's unrecognizable to these sad puppy uh, readers uh, who only want the same thing over and over again so i'm kind of like dodging your question by not naming genre <laughs> and kind of it might be the breakdown of that genre specificity of that kind of community specificity that is where that maybe the utopian energy is right now well, I mean, it's it's almost like, you know, with, with Harold Bloom in his canon or, or the canon in general, it's a matter of like, well, who decides what the canon is, right? And once you start to break down, well, we should be reading more of this and, and, and how many writers and brilliant pieces of work have been lost to history and time because it didn't fit the specificity that is the canon, right? Absolutely. And I mean, even just today, I just heard um, right before I came on to uh, do the interview with you all that the magazine of fantasy and science fiction has just named uh, Sherry Renee Thomas um, as its new editor. Right. And uh, Sherry Renee Thomas, um, a black woman who was famous for the kind of dark matters anthologies and the recovery of, uh, of uh, African diasporic writers and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that had often been kicked out of the canon. Right. They'd always mm -hmm. been there. They'd always been writing. They'd always been doing work in science fiction and fantasy and horror. But the canon just kind of like locked them out. Right. That's a um, huge shift. The magazine of science fiction and fantasy now has a black um, editor. Yes. Black woman wow. yeah. editor. Yeah. I mean, and, and how often do you see that? I mean, like, how come we don't know, um, you know, Samuel Delaney's name or Octavia Butler's name or, you know, and the Bronte sisters. And these are all like you have these tiny specific points of light where realistically how many mediocre white men got really good book deals because they were more in line with the canon and how many great books did we lose out on as a result? Right. I think about that every time my students ask me why I'm not teaching Dune in this course, right? And and, and X course <laughs> that I'm teaching, and I'm like, I just it to me it just reads as like the whitest white man novel in the world. I'm sorry, Dune fans. I know this is one of those things that my background in fandom uh, makes me persona non grata at times. I can't stand the novel Dune, um, and every time I think about it, I'm just like, I can teach like. A, a Nettie Okorafor novel, a Todd A. Thompson novel, you know, something from like Stephen Graham Jones in the amount of time that I would teach this one sweeping, large, white dude, like, tome, doorstop novel. 
Um, and uh, it does kind of like annoy some of my students who come from like a background in fandom that I'm, I'm occasionally teaching that the non, uh, I guess, science fiction canonical text. And that, that is always the question I get. It's like, how come Dune isn't on the syllabus? Because <laughs> um, you've uh, all read it already. Yeah. Right. <laughs> It's, it sounds like there's a common denominator, at least in some of these emergent genres like solar punk, hope punk, um, any of the ones that have decided to give themselves a title, and that's climate change. Um, and in an essay about uh, Blade Runner 2049, you wrote 2049 gives us Earth as it already is, and through its near future world building reveals to us that we cannot or will not see our own Anthropocene present, that the disaster has already happened. Um, could you talk a little bit about what anthropogenic world building means, um, especially, you know, given the climate change is like at the forefront in our future now? Mm. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> what what uh, myself and my co-author in that piece, uh, Sarah Hamblin, we're really trying to think about is like we had what. So Sarah Hamblin is, is a film scholar. I should say she's also my partner. Um, she's a film scholar at UMB, and we walked out of Blade Runner 2049, and we were both blown away by this film. And this is maybe one of those other things. Like, this, if, if putting, if not liking uh, Dune puts me on the outsider of fandom oftentimes, liking Blade Runner 2049 often puts me on the outskirts of academic, <laughs> academic science fiction. Where I'm well, right it, there with you. Like, I was so shocked by that film, too. I loved um, it. But, People hated it for some reason. Yeah, almost no, everybody it. seemed to hate it. I thought it was great. <laughs> I loved yeah, it. I absolutely know. loved it. Um, and what I really liked about it is like the way I, th I think I liked what a lot of like academics didn't like. I think academics wanted it to be this like stunningly progressive film. Um, and one of the reasons I really liked it is it felt like it was dealing with climate change in an oddly realistic kind of way. Right. So like so many of the kind of major scenes of like a catastrophic climate in Blade Runner. Sorry, my phone's ringing in the background. I'm going to turn that off. Uh, I'm now I'm now the person I yell at in my classes. <laughs> um, so like one of the things that I thought was really fascinating is like that scene of Las Vegas, right, where it's all like irradiated and orange. Yeah, that's already happened. That was taken from um, like these uh, storms that were happening in Australia at the time. Mm -hmm. Right. These like the the junk. Uh, scenes and I think it's supposed to be like San Diego like, like those were already taken from like real pictures like Blade Runner was not presenting us a future world at all it's mise-en-scene it's imagery of a devastated climate are all actually things that exist in the here and now um, and so what I found fascinating about it is it it is revealing to us that this this is not the future this is not some dystopian landscape it's it, like open your fucking eyes people you are living in Blade Runner, right? Mm -hmm. All the suckiness of this world is your world if you kind of look at it. And this is, there's a, a science fiction scholar who says this, like this is what science fiction does. It doesn't reveal to us what doesn't exist yet. It opens us our eyes to those things that we can't see um, in our reality. And so like anthropogenic climate change, right? Which is just a fancy way of saying um, human made climate change, right? The anthros is the human there. Right. Um, and so that's, that's another way of thinking the Anthropocene, right, where the where humans have left their mark on the geologic scale. Right. That, that, that's now measurable uh, geologic change by human intervention. Um, it's part and parcel now of something like Blade Runner, where it has to build climate change into its world building. Yet at the same ha hand, it, it can't really do anything with it. Right. It's just kind of like now like there. Um, and that's what I found so fascinating about it as a film. It was like on one hand, so like in your face, revealing all of this kind of awful stuff to us. On the other hand, it was like, yeah, so it's there. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. doesn't really have anything to say about it. <laughs> it's like that's what I find fascinating about it. It's like this post cyberpunk that just kind of like says, OK, this is the situation. Now, how do we live in it? You know, and that's part of the story, the world building of it. Yeah, like get a helmet, fuckers. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> World sucks. Get a helmet. Right. There, there, there's like it, I find that really kind of like oddly um, alluring. Like and, and it's like how carefully it builds it into these to this mise en scène, so it becomes gorgeous and overpowering, uh, like oddly sublime, and then it kind of like aestheticizes it. But the narrative has nothing to do with this, like, you know, irradiated world or this post-apocalyptic world, right? It just kind of 
is. Um, and so it reminds me of this, uh, we, we compared it to a, a book by a guy named Roy Scranton, who says like, really what human beings need to do is like, they need to learn to die in the Anthropocene. Um, <laughs> and it sounds more pessimistic than it is. Um, <laughs> what he means is like our, our kind of common conception of humanity, of progress and technology. Like we, we need to end because all of it, we need to stop that. We need a new vision of humanity, a new sense of living in the Anthropocene because our common sense versions of living are the things that are causing the Anthropocene, right? And so like every moment that like Blade Runner raises the Anthropocene, all the other technology and like the living that's going on in that film are also part and parcel of creating that same kind of post-apocalyptic anthropogenic uh, landscape, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, what, what's crazy too is that I thought this film spoke more to the original book than the original film did. Which, if if that's like the most heretical thing to say, like the the idea of like giving up y yourself to this spiritual like desolation, which happens in the original book and sort of is physically shown to us in this movie, I thought was really neat too. So I wanted to get your take on that. Oh, yeah. I think the sequel is way more uh, in line with kind of Philip K. Mm -hmm. Dick's vision where, I mean, I guess people probably know this if they're, you know, uh, but like, you know, the original Blade Runner, um, you know, its title is taken from an entirely different uh, script, mm -hmm. right? That had absolutely nothing to do with Philip right. K. Dick's book, mm -hmm. um, you know, it had like zero to do with it. And there's something about the original Blade Runner film that, uh, it's almost kind of it's i don't even know how to describe it like i like it, it's so like oddly disconnected from the book like it, it mm -hmm. cares about this kind of replicant uh i guess issue but it kind of largely leaves beyond uh the kind of post-nuclear world or so many of the other issues that are happening in philip k dick's book or even with as you know, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah or even just like the psychology of like the characters, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Philip K. Dick's book is fantastic for the way that these like characters try to like meld themselves in some way to make peace to this kind of world and what that kind mm -hmm. of means. And I think there's something about that that's really captured in, oh shit, how have I forgotten his name? What's the guy who's, who's the, not, not Deckard, but- Oh, Isidore? The, the, um... Gosling. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought I my characters. <laughs> No, this is, this is uh -huh. me like having like a, a series of brain farts here. Um, but it's, yeah, it's like there's something about Ryan Gosling's uh, performance of this kind of um, non-heroic masculinity in this movie that is, mm -hmm. is oddly really appealing to me because he is like such that kind of paragon of like masculinity in so many other movies. And that, that kind of like resignation that he brings to the film, uh, to me, it, it does kind of rhyme a bit more with uh, Philip K. Dick's vision. Yeah because I'm going to just blunder into it. <laughs> um, you you do a lot on uh, African and African-American uh, sci-fi and such. Uh, I would say that is one of the, the weakest areas that I don't read, uh, not out of habit, but just out of, uh, I don't see it as out there as much. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is definitively is there anything definitively different about it uh, coming from like a cultural standpoint or anything that you can say are the uh, earmarks of it being a, an African-American or African uh, sci-fi? I guess like the, the easiest way for me to kind of approach a, a question like this um, is first, like, I, I guess like I, I, one of the things I was beginning to kind of look at in my research was um, a kind of split between Afrofuturism and what's now um, really being codified as African futurism um, as one word. So African and futurism kind of combined. Yeah. And so like one of the kind of, uh, I guess, complaints from a lot of African diasporic and African science fiction writers is the way that their work was getting shoehorned um, into an Afrofuturist uh, rhetoric. And the way that Afrofuturism developed was largely a kind of um, Americentric African American kind of perspective, and one of the things that I think separates African futurism, or I shouldn't even say I think uh, separates African futurism. One of the things that people who are um, thinking about this notion of African futurism, people like Nnedi Okorafor, uh, Sophia Samatar, Tade Thompson, uh, some of these writers, is that I guess what African futurism does is it really foregrounds an African perspective, right? And so it's it's 
cultural touchstones are just going to be very different um, than um, science fiction that's being produced um, in the U.S., even by, by writers of color in the U.S., right? Uh, somebody who is living in uh, Nigeria and Ghana and Kenya and South Africa, they're just going to have a very different kind of experience of the world, of world structures, of world systems, um, and, but also just a very kind of cultural uh, difference. And so like one of the things that you'll often find, uh, I'm thinking about the, the editors of uh, uh, Umenana, which is an African uh, speculative fiction journal, uh, so they publish uh, writers uh, basically mostly within Africa, some from the African dias diaspora. Uh, but one of the things they kind of talk about is that in different kind of African cultures, the notion of like what is real and what is speculative might be very different than uh, for those of us living in the West about like what constitutes real and what constitutes speculative. Um, that the kind of uh, the, the sense, the cultural touchstone of uh of of gods of uh trickster characters of uh people of these kind of entities that exist in the world here and now aren't seen as being speculative they're seen as being realist um, and so one of the things that really uh i think makes african african futurism so kind of profound um is exactly that is is the realizing that this world is not singular Right. We have, I think, particularly those of us living in the U.S., we, we often kind of think that the rest of the world just kind of like, you know, looks and thinks like we do. Right. There's a real, you know, Americentric kind of point of view. And one of the things that this does is it just kind of disabuses us as readers of that and uh, makes us have to see very kind of competing and different and just other Right, things that really can't be subsumed to our kind of conceptual categories, our ways of thinking. Um, and so it makes reality um, richer, fuller, more vibrant, um, but also um, under contestation. Right? What counts as real um, all of a sudden becomes something that has to be kind of like, you know, discussed. And I think that's really cool about it. So for me, that's where I think a lot of these uh, maybe differences with like African futurism come from and reading it, what makes it African futurist is this just complete decentering of um, a Western point of view as taken as the kind of, you know, ontological groundwork for reality. I think that's really important, especially when it comes to sci-fi, because I think it's when people are so willing and able to accept different viewpoints from different alien species and, you know, other sci-fi books, and yet we have such a difficult time looking at it from a different world perspective in our own world. I mean, like, I think that speaks to a lot of how sci-fi is and what it can do, right? Like the ability to open your eyes to something that you're, you know, when you're so willing to see worlds that are different and you're ignoring everything around you or not everything, but you know. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, I was thinking about something like uh, I was reading an interview with uh, Tade Thompson. Uh, Tade Thompson's a Nigerian British uh, science fiction author. If you haven't read the Rosewater series, it is just just so phenomenal, and I think some of my favorite science fiction that I've read in a long time. Uh, Tade Thompson's just blowing things out of the water right now. He's uh, amazing. Uh, but I was reading an interview with him. Uh, so he was born in the UK to Nigerian parents, moved to Nigeria. I can't remember exactly, but when he was still fairly young, so around like four or five, and went through universe, went from there to his like early 20s living in Nigeria and then moved back to the UK. Um, and so he's had, uh, you know, experiences both in the UK and Nigeria. Um, it's when he, he writes a lot of fiction set in uh, Nigeria, the Rosewater Trilogy, reimagines a like a first contact alien scenario, but instead of being in like DC or London or the kind of usual kind of uh, places we imagine these things, he, he sees it in um, uh, just outside of Lagos. And one of the things uh, somebody was like calling out to him, like there was, there, there, at one point there's a character who's kind of chained up in a house and somebody kind of uh, called him out on this. It was like, well, why, when these other characters met this character who was chained up, why, why didn't they have a bigger reaction? And Todd A. Thompson was like, well, because it's maybe, you know, I, I, I saw a person kind of chained up for the first time when I was a boy in, in Nigeria, right? And so this kind of like perspectives, right? The shifts on kind of uh, even what we take as kind of normal on a day-to-day -day reality, let alone a science fictional reality, are just entirely kind of different. 
right? Um, and they they have to make us when we read stuff like that. It has to kind of make us kind of open up. And those of us who are from my, like myself from the West, uh, who grew up and lived most of his life in, in the U.S., right? We just have to like begin to kind of see the world in a much more expansive um, manner. I guess is the only way I can kind of say that. So I'm kind of tripping over my words here. No, that's that's totally fine. I I, I always you know I, I keep going back to what we were talking about earlier when there's like what science fiction and or genre fiction in general, but what it does is it, it it exteriorizes the internal. And especially when we're, when we as people are so obsessed with the internal workings of the human and you take a genre like science fiction or fantasy and it takes all of that and it just puts it into the world building. It puts it into the setting itself for us to examine. I, I think that a lot of the times something that even I have, admittedly kind of ignored is the idea of examining the settings as much as I do the characters. Because to me, a lot of the times, especially, you know, before I kind of got a little bit smarter about it, the setting was just exactly that. It was window dressing as opposed to something that I should actively be paying attention to. And I think that's, if uh, to put like a, a fine point on this, to like return to like one of the first questions, like how the hell did I get into science fiction studies, if not through fandom and other stuff in, in academia? Um, one of the reasons I really kind of turned to science fiction studies, one of the reasons I've been really happy that I've been able to make it my main academic home is that I was just bored to shit with reading uh, contemporary white dude fiction. Like I just couldn't read one more novel about some guy who's in his mid forties or fifties, is divorced, is trying to put a relationship back together with his daughter. Um, and what so much of that fiction kind of said to me is like, we just take the world for granted. We know the world, right? It's this kind of self-assured, smug, white, masculine centric, heteronormative that the world is just kind of taken for granted. Um, and what I've really loved about turning to science fiction is to a certain extent, um, one of the things that science fiction tells us is we, and that's trying to say about like Todd A. Thompson and African futurism, is we can't take the world for granted. We can't just kind of assume that we know what the world is or how reality operates. And it calls all of that into kind of question, whether that's from kind of technical perspectives of like, you know, infrastructure or politics all the way down to kind of a cultural kind of uh, notions of what even constitutes reality or real um, in this world. It, it takes that kind of smug self-assuredness um, away from us. That is often the kind of uh, sine qua non, I would say, of, of so much kind of contemporary realist fiction. Um, I, I think like the Jonathan Franz and not like, I just can't read one more fucking Jonathan Franz. <laughs> um, I can't read that kind of smug, self-assured uh, kind of uh, fiction that just uh, assumes the world is a projection of its own interiority. Hey, look, the corrections was actually really good. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I will defend that novel at the very least. I know I'm killing a lot of, I'm killing a lot of babies here today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, that's, that's totally fine because everyone, I, I think having dialogue like this is important just to, just to make sure that it's like, you can love sci-fi and also, you know, have these opinions and have this conversation and dialogue because God damn it, how else are we supposed to learn and grow as a society without stuff like this around? Oh, for sure. And I mean, as much as I, I love teaching uh, science fiction, I still teach contemporary British literature. I still teach the, the bourgeois realist novel, which I've been bagging on, um, I, you know, reading any of these things uh, outside of each other or somehow like in a pure vacuum is a weird exercise anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm being a little a little fast and loose and a little facetious. Uh, but there, there is but that is kind of why I liked science fiction. But yeah, I, I think I mean, even like if you go back to the old kind of definition of like science fiction is so different than uh, mimetic fiction. I think uh, was it Samuel Delaney who referred to like um, mimetic fiction or like realism as mundane fiction. I think it was Delaney, right? As a way of kind of like, you know, giving an underhanded kind of, uh, you know, dismissal of it. It's, it's mundane. It's boring. <laughs> um, on the other hand, like you could read like Victorian doorstop novels as like exercises in world building. Right? They were trying to think about the kind of creation of this new middle class bourgeois world of the industrial revolution and how that was like changing the landscapes and you know, all this other kind of stuff. So it's not like only science fiction does this or like science fiction where it came out of some kind of vacuum, right, that it doesn't have its relationships to realist fiction. I mean, Kinsale Robinson says science fiction is the new realism, right? It's the, <laughs> it is doing that stuff. 
Um, mm. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm being a little fast and loose, and I'm I'm, uh, I'm 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 abusing some of the other stuff that I don't like in the name of, of science fiction. But it's not like these things are, are so separate, or that their borders aren't permeable, and there there aren't relationships between them. Of course, of course. You can send all of your angry letters to Hugh. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Daniel, you had a quick yeah. question. Speaking of world building, um, you know, being that this is a world building podcast, and while I understand um, you're not necessarily a creative writer, you have read a tremendous amount in the genre, and especially in science fiction and fantasy and speculative fiction in general. Um, is there a single piece of advice you could give to fledgling world builders that you you think has worked well in the work that you've been studying and reading? I guess the the the, the shout out I would give is to the work that like somebody like Nisi Shaw has done on like how to incorporate viewpoints, perspectives, and cultures that aren't your own, right? Um, there there is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of angst. I think out there about like, how do we kind of um, appropriate, appropriately um, represent uh, cultures, positions, um, all kinds of, you know, identities that are not our own. Um, and I think somebody like Nisi Shaw has done this kind of wonderful work on this, right? And this is maybe part of my dislike of something like um, even, uh, oh God, what was I bashing earlier? Dune, right? In the way that it just kind of uses, uh, uh, you know, a Middle Eastern or Arabic or Islamic kind of sets of cultural codes to just kind of create otherness, right? You know, it's like that otherness is not other to somebody who's Arabic or Middle Eastern or Islamic, right? And so the way that it just becomes coded purely as otherness. And so I guess my, my, my advice is like, yeah, like do your research. Don't be, don't, you know, shy away from incorporating voices that aren't your own. Uh, but, you know, there, there's resources out there. Uh, and I, I think Nisi Shaw is the one who's done the most about these kind of like, how do you world build and be inclusive without being appropriating? Um, and so I would look into a lot of those kind of resources. Uh, I've mm -hmm. often had my students read them, um, even though we're not writing science fiction, but we're studying it to kind of think about how is science fiction either bringing in other voices or how is it appropriating other voices in its world mm -hmm. building? And I think that's a, it's a fine line, uh, but that that's what maybe I would be, that's what I would maybe advise, if that makes sense. Mm. Well, with that being said, I know you said you're not much of uh, an improver, but that's exactly what we're rolling into right now <laughs> as we roll into the world building jam session. So I hope you're ready um, because well, man, fun. this is, I'm, I'm <laughs> looking to have a lot of fun here. All right, so the world building jam session, the way that this works is we're gonna create a scenario that is focused on the dice. And the genre of that is can be between science fiction, fantasy, horror, modern day, romance, or the superhero genre. Uh, and we're going to be rolling the genre now. That's gonna be a modern day setting, okay? And the subject is going to be between an item, a monster, a place, a historical figure, an event, or a cataclysm. And we're going to be rolling that as a historical figure. And we have a theme, and that theme can be between tragedy, sacrifice, love, metamorphosis, pride and honor, madness and the unspeakable, triumph and hope, or treachery and revenge. And we're going to see what we get here. That's going to be pride and honor. And so we have a modern day setting, the theme um, I'm sorry, with a historical figure and a theme of pride and honor. Hugh, as our guest, you get to start us off. So please go right ahead. I'm, I'm almost not even sure like how to dive into this because I, I, to, to be entirely honest with you, my whole brain is just kind of consumed with the election. And so all I can think of is a modern day setting of a historical figure whose pride and <laughs> honor I want to see. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, and so like, uh, that, that's where I am when I, he when I hear those kind of touchstones. Um, and I think about that as a possibility for world building. I think about the other world that could be built by the destruction of this kind of uh, pride <laughs> and honor um, and maybe uh, other values <laughs> coming up. So I might not be being very helpful here. 
You know that no, that's I mean, what do we draw from? We draw from experience. We draw from our own per- what we know, right? You write what you know, and I imagine that right now there's a lot of people who are experiencing or have experienced a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety based on someone's pride and honor. Uh, but let's try and create a scenario based around the 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 fall or the 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 breaking of one's pride and honor. Is that what you want to do? I, I I see that as an oddly hopeful utopian perspective. Okay, so let's let's start there then. Do we want to make it American or do we want to make it something else? Uh, dealer's choice. All right, uh, Daniel, I'll, I'll I'll delegate that to you. Well, I think um, since we're doing a modern setting, we could possibly do like an alternate history or an um, alternate future. So maybe, um, you know, we're imagining the outcome, say, of this election, so we're setting it in the near future. Um, and the, like we said, the breaking of the pride and honor would be the destruction of the administration. We could be very literal, literal with it, but then see where that goes and imagine like a utopian future that comes out of it. Yeah, that sounds fun. Why don't we start there? Uh, so, so, well, <laughs> I was I was having this conversation recently as well. It's that no matter what happens tomorrow, we still have a tremendous amount of work to do in the oncoming mm-hmm. months and weeks ahead. You know, no, no matter who wins, we all lose. It's like AVP, you know. Oh, God, you have to say <laughs> it. <laughs> Look, I'm willing to bring Schlock into this, okay? God damn it. This is, this is, it can't be all high art and everything like Those that. Those are some of my favorite movies of all time. So. Why don't we wait, put wait, wait, wait. in there? Wait. Are you saying that Alien vs. Predator is one of your favorite movies of all time? Particularly the sequel. AVP. Oh my god, oh, wow. no. Wow. <laughs> from 2049, sir, to that movie. <laughs> They're both on the same field. I don't see what... <laughs> you know what sucks? Fucking Dune. Fuck Dune. You know what's great? <laughs> oh my god. I think I just lost my PhD. <laughs> That's been revoked. <laughs> That's a death of honor and pride right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why don't we do yeah, something is... absurd like that in the setting? Why not? Let's take something that's like Alien versus Predator, since you really, you really love it, and put it in this crazy near future. Why not? You, you know what? Hold on. I will be merciful. I'm just going to roll the twist and see what fucking happens. Because my God, let's let's just let's make mercy kill this. Yeah. Uh. Oh, so now uh, we get to change the genre. How about that? There we that? go. All right. So it becomes a sci-fi. What? Oh, no. Actually, day. it's horror now. Or it becomes horror. <laughs> yeah. So we switched so from still modern, set day, modern day <laughs> yep, to horror, which I mean, same thing. Same difference, right? It still uh, feels modern day to me because it, like, I guess the most horrific thing I can imagine like out of a, a scenario like this would be like, all right, so we uh, vote Trump out of office. We kill the big baddie. But what happens in the killing of the big baddie is the unleash- unleashing of all that kind of uh, pride um, as a kind of uh, preternatural force um, that would now then need to be kind of battled, accounted for. I, I like the idea that Trump is some kind of a tulpa or perhaps some oh. kind of like uh, a, the, the product of a sin eater. You know, where he is literally all of society's ills and and bad things that are happening is once he's out, it's suddenly like you free it all to be, you know, unleashed upon the world again. Uh, Sorry, that might be too real of a nightmare scenario. (laughs) (laughs) You're right. We'll go back to AVP (laughs) too. That's why why I'm saying we need to put an anchor of something absurd in the future. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, I mean, horror doesn't mean it has to be all horror, right? Let's right. Say, so let's, let's make it absurd. Let's make it. Um... Maybe, maybe. Okay. Following off of what you were saying. So we remove the, the big bad from office and then all of the ills are still kind of burdened on the people. What if it creates some kind of like um, zombie virus or something like that? Not as literally a zombie virus, but something I would, like I would like to reject zombie virus outright. Thank well, you very much. I, that's what I'm saying. Like not a literal zombie virus, but I'm thinking like the, his supporters somehow become emboldened in a way that's like a virus. Hmm. Uh, okay. So if we're going, if we're going schlocky, I'm now mm-hmm. thinking of Ghostbusters 2, 
where there is that pink slime that makes everyone really Ooh. angry and yes. mean at each other, but That's also feeds thinking. off of that. Yeah. Something crazy. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so let's not make it, um, oh, you know what? Hold on. This is going to sound super dumb, but I also mm-hmm. love it. Uh, so there are, there is now suddenly, uh, a spirit or perhaps a parasite yes. that attaches itself to masks in particular. <gasps> and go. so we can have this kind of fun little, you know, subversion where those who wear ma- masks are the monsters. You know, oh, and they're they're taken over by this contagion in an ironic sense. Oh, yeah, and you can have this kind of like okay, and now this is unfair, but actually fair. You can have this like <laughs> yokel party, right? Who are like no masker type characters who yeah. actually have to try and save the day, but it's like a slapstick sort of thing, and it's totally absurdist. Alternatively, um, you can just go with like, hey, they have to learn empathy in order to defeat yes. the mask wearers. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Daniel, yesterday I heard the term yeehaw, yeehawist, and it was yeah, exactly. That's what I was imagining. Oh, God. you know, you're the typical deplorable. That's what. That's oh, what we're so, talking so about. this is kind of like a, a, a what was the name of that movie? Tucker and Dave style. Yes, Tucker and uh, Dale. See, yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. A horror movie where it's I could see it almost being like a zombie survival film, mm-hmm. but now it's everyone who is it just like yeah, we told you we were right. But <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my god. It's like idiocracy, but alien versus predator. That's what we're saying. And less eugenics. <laughs> it's like a survivalist kind of turned inside out. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All, right. All right. You know what? I feel like we're not going to get better than that. So let's <laughs> let's just go ahead and call it. Um, all right, Hugh. Are you ready for the rapid fire portion of the interview? Of course not, but I don't think you're supposed to be ready for a rapid Excellent. Fall. All right. So my wife wants to know, is cereal a soup? Please. I really hope not. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what have you been uh what have you been reading lately? Besides a bunch of midterm papers, I'm sure. Oh, it, I, I've been going back and rereading a bunch of the issues of New Worlds from the 60s, from when Michael Moorcock took over editorship. Um, oh. and so it became, New Worlds became that kind of, you know, foundation for the, the new wave of SF in the 60s, until like the Zolines and the Brunners and the, the Ballards. So I've been reading a lot of old issues of New Waves be, or New Worlds because you can now find them scanned online if you search. Very cool. And uh, name someone who's not yourself who you'd like to shout out. Uh, to my students for surviving this hellscape. <laughs> <laughs> That's deeply appreciated. You have no idea how much that makes me feel better right now. But still, uh, Daniel, you go ahead and g- give us a question. If you would rather be haunted by the ghost of Heinlein um, or Ursula Le Guin, which would be uh, the one you'd, you'd choose? Oh, Ursula Le Guin every day of the week. <laughs> All right. And uh, do you, uh, I guess this is kind of a weird question. Do you have anything to plug? Um, not that I think the average person's going <laughs> to want to read. I mean, um, as, as you heard from the quote of the paper I wrote on Blade Runner, uh, this stuff is not exactly scintillating page turner kind of material. <laughs> um, no. So I, uh, you know, what? instead I will plug Todd A. Thompson. Everybody should read the Rosewater trilogy from Todd A. Thompson because it's just one of the finest trilogies in SF right now. So I'll plug somebody else. <laughs> Excellent. And we'll make sure that when you have your treaties on AVB2, we'll, we'll make sure that comes <laughs> out as well. All right. Hugh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really goddamn fun. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And we're back. Uh, gentlemen, what did you think about the interview? I really enjoyed it, learned some things, and I like to believe that he was talking about uh, a different Dune. <laughs> I was so excited to find another 2049 fan who like loved it as much as I did. It's a good film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I see. I I haven't heard too many people like bad mouth that movie, which is why I was surprised that people brought up like the criticism that it's mm-hmm. facing. But yeah, I, I've only heard it being referred to as very good. It's because you're surrounded by people with such good taste. Uh-huh. I uh, I mean it's just me and my wife in the apartment so I suppose you're right. <laughs> and I want to see Batista in more films. I uh, look, Batista is fucking great. He's always been great. 
Uh, shout out to him in Man with the Iron Fists. Um, shout out to him. At, you know what? Drax, whatever. That's fine. He's he, That was his <laughs> breakout role. But really, in my heart, he'll always be the bronze man. But, you know. Uh, also, you can tell that, man, there sure is a lot of political tension and anxiety happening in our world right now because Weird. that's kind of pervasive. But you know, your last few days before the country burns down, guys. Yeah. To future us. Have hope. Yeah. To, to future us. Uh, remember that it's like five hours to the border and it's probably going to be a line. <laughs> So <laughs> Rob, <laughs> no one's going to be wearing masks, unfortunately. Uh, I I think this would be the actual appropriate time to say like, good night and good luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah, yeah. You're not even wrong, but uh, but honestly, uh, I I do appreciate talking about sci-fi specifically because I think it is a genre that gives us hope, that allows us to dream a dream that isn't our own, and that to remember that there are things that we can achieve and aspire to, even though things kind of suck right now, there's still the hope of the future. Well, and, and Alien versus Predator. Yes, and an Alien versus Predator, that's correct. Um, I also, uh, to Professor Hugh O'Connell, I apologize for having your PhD revoked. Um, <laughs> it just happens sometimes when people come on the show, you know? Yeah, actually, this is a first for us. Um, I, 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 I'm kind of proud of it, but only a little. <laughs> Did you know Rich Baker had a um, PhD before he came too? Uh, yeah, yeah, and he's since been stripped. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that'll just about do it for this episode of World Build with Us. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Remember that if you want to send us a cool world building prompt, you can email us at worldbuildwithus at gmail.com, or you can go ahead and send us a tweet over at Let's World Build. And remember that if you wanted VIP access to that, meaning that we get to your prompt quicker, you can always go ahead and donate to us on Patreon. Or if you just want to come chat with us at all, just, you know, come hang by our Discord and we'll be there chatting about the end of the world or, you know, the bright future that we may or may not have. Yeah. But remember, either way, remember that we're going to get through this together. We love you very much and we'll see you next week. Bye.